Oh, there's a live button. Yeah, we, we are live. Hi, everyone, people of the internet. Uh, I'm Bertrand Leroy. This is On.NET, a uh, weekly chat with the .NET team and guests. Today, we also have Rich uh, Lender with us. And our guest is Nick Craver from Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow doesn't need to be introduced, I'm sure. It's one of the cornerstones of the internet nowadays. It's actually hard to imagine a developer's life without Stack Overflow. Uh, I think every single one of us goes there daily, if not several times a day. Uh, so hi, Nick. Hello. All right, so um, how is it like to work for Stack Overflow? It's pretty good. The gas mileage is great. We're uh, we're mostly remote, so uh, you know the teams are all over the world, and we just get uh, talent from everywhere. So it's pretty cool because you actually learn something a little bit every day. Uh, so working here, it's great because you know hopefully there's people watching, right? You get to help. Yeah, I, I launch something with ten lines of code, and hopefully I save tens of thousands or millions of developer hours with it. And it's kind of rare to get that kind of opportunity, right? So it's a uh, it's cool the big kind of wins we get, which is you know. While we care about you know the perf, the code, the examples, the open source, all good stuff. And luckily, the company backs it. Like from a moral or you know goal standpoint, it's very compatible. Um, wish it was more common, but I think we're working on that. Yeah, definitely huge impact on everything you're doing. Uh, so, can you describe your role at Stack Overflow? What do you do? Oh boy. Um, so uh, my role is a little weird. There's not a whole lot of roles like mine in particular at Stack Overflow. Uh, Jeff Dalgus is my partner in crime, the closest. I work on both the dev teams, so I write you know software, uh, JavaScript, C Sharp, SQL, all all the way through. Uh, and then I'm also on the SRE teams. So we're tuning switches, we're changing up how BGP works, we're you know architecting the data centers, networks. Um, yesterday we're ordering hardware, you know specific SSDs, specific network cards. Uh, you know whether do you want RDMA offload, do you want new switches, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have some uh, servers getting too hot in the New York data center for uh, monitoring, actually. <laughs> it's, we can go into that if you want. Um, and uh, we, uh, we'll spend a day ordering hardware. Uh, just now, I'm fixing some C-sharp code. Uh, a little bit later, we'll be doing a performance for the developer survey, launching Monday. Um, and then other times, it's uh, you know designing APIs, uh, SQL backends. I'm the closest thing we have to a DBA. Probably, mm -hmm. uh, although we don't, they, well, I don't spend a lot of time on it. So we don't have a DBA. We just have some guys who are good at SQL. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit of everything, which is really fun because you wake up today and you have no idea what's going to be on fire in the morning, and that will determine the rest of your day, right? Uh, yeah, you should, you should enjoy fire drills, I suppose. Uh, yeah, it's good because you're like, oh god, there's we we actually uh, we have a monitor that is tweets per second, and if the Stack Overflow name appears too often on Twitter, that is your down alarm, among many others. Uh, how many how many tweets do you see currently? Uh, hopefully, very few. Uh, I mean, people are talking about Stack Overflow all the time, but if we get, um, you know, hundreds per minute or thousands per minute, then something's probably gone wrong. Usually so if it. people tweet you, that's bad news. That, that's yes. surprising. <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes if we launch the developer survey, it could be good, but uh, generally, yeah, very bad. Um, and then we've got, I guess you can't see it's out of view over here. We have monitoring dashboards always up. Um, mm. And like I said, we're around the world, right? So uh, when I go to bed, uh, a guy in Alaska is kind of starting his day. And it's, and we, you know, with people in Slovenia, Germany, UK, all over the world. Uh, so there's always someone awake. If you're bored and working in chat, people do not keep nine to five hours. It is very different than being on a campus, right? Yeah. It's not only that we're remote, the time zones are, and especially daylight savings time creates a lot of fun with meetings. Because uh, <laughs> you're like, when is it? I have no clue. Google will tell me, and maybe it'll be right. Uh, but uh, it's, it's interesting because you don't, you know, you'll go, you'll wake up with one set of people and you'll end the day with a completely different set of people. And this is true for almost everyone working here. It's kind of mm. cool, right? Yeah, it is. So how many people were uh, for Stack Overflow today? I think uh, total company size, we're at like 250, 260 range. Uh, almost two-thirds of that or more is sales. Uh, the engineering, I think the last engineering headcount was like 60 to 80. Um, I, can, I can find out for certain if you want to. Uh, after this, oh. David could tell me. All park is, is I'm, I'm sure, fine. Uh, mm -hmm. So you said something that I find really interesting um, about how you manage your own hardware. 
Um, and when you look at major websites, you actually see both uh, cloud-based and uh, mm-hmm. private data centers. For example, Netflix is is on the cloud now after mm-hmm. having their own data centers for years. Mm-hmm. Um, Facebook obviously has their own their own stuff. So, can you? Talk about that choice and uh, what it means for you and what benefits you get from it and what disadvantages that actually you get. Yeah, we just hate the word cloud, really. Um, no, there's uh, <laughs> there's all sorts of stuff in play. You know, uh, Netflix, and people will always give Netflix as an example, right? Uh, they actually are just now on the cloud. It took them seven years from start to finish to eliminate their on-site data centers for a myriad of reasons we don't really need to go into. For us, uh, performance. You can't get the performance we want out of the cloud. Just no one offers this. You don't have the level of control you need to get that level of performance. Now, that's not without trade-off differences. Like I said, there are disadvantages, right? Um, let's cover those first. The disadvantages you get into specifically with us is uh, geolocation, right? Whether you're on Cloudflare hitting a local termination point, which we need for HTTPS speed, because you still have a round trip. Even if you optimize the crap out of it, you're still eating one round trip, right? Even with TLS false start and everything in play. Uh, so when you're coming to New York, that's a penalty. The guy in Australia doesn't like that situation at all. The best thing we can do is put some servers nearer to them, rendering. Now in the cloud, generally, like you kind of have this built in. You've designed your app that way from the beginning, and you're in a data center in Asia. You're in one in Europe. You're in one in the U.S. Uh, maybe South America if you're lucky, right? So that kind of stuff is where the cloud wins in terms of transmission time. But what we find almost always is the time to render a page, uh, especially as dynamic as we do, is just uh, so much pain there in terms of time, it's a net loss, right? And I actually have a blog post planned for this like that goes in-depth on uh, the cost differences as well, like performance, dollars, all of that, and you know, using AWS and Azure as examples. So on-site, we can control the network. We're all 10 gig between the hardware. We have 11 web servers, mostly for redundancy. We can run Stack Overflow off of one. That's unheard of in the cloud, right? So uh, the result of that is not strictly hardware, although that's part of it. It's mostly software because we control everything on top of .NET. We're not running third-party stuff much, right? So we can control uh, and tune the performance of pretty much anything that's slow. You just profile it. You found the slowest thing, and you move to, and you fix that, and you move to the next one, right? And we've just been doing that for years. It's not really a complicated process. Uh, when you reach the in the cloud, though, what you typically have is the network blipped. I have no clue why. <laughs> I just have no control over that, right? AWS actually has a notoriously bad network. People were saying, oh, I can get a file uh, transfer at 9 gig a second. Yes, that's, the speed is typically fine if there's no packet loss. The, the problem is loss in that situation, and it's sporadic and unexplainable, and you, just, you don't know what's going on, right? If we have packet loss, we have packet caps on our network running continuously. Um, we don't uh, store that. It's way too much data. But we store like the last five minutes in a circular PCI buffer, right? And Or PCI SSD buffer. And uh, we can tell when something happens, we can capture it real quick and then go figure out what happened. Was the switch overloaded? Was the Are we sending too many packets per second? You get these like micro-bursting type of stuff is what we run into as Stack Overflow, right? So, uh, and this is one of the disadvantages not of having our own hardware, but of being so efficient. Right, uh, the efficiency is not always a good thing. If you can run this many uh, web requests through a single web server, that's great, right? But now, what new limits are you hitting that other people just don't even think about, right? When you hit connection pooling, you have a hundred connections by default in a .NET connection pool. Well, that doesn't really work if you handle all of Stack Overflow's traffic through one pool. The, the way our network works is Stack Overflow, Server Fault, all of the hundreds of websites are actually one app pool in one IIS container, right? There's one single process running all of that. It's a multi-tenant application. So if you're handling all that through one thing, you're dealing with one connection pool per site. And for Stack Overflow, that's actually the point that falls over first. So you need to boost things like connection pools. You need to boost uh, ephemeral port exhaustion, right? How many ports are from the load balancer to the web server? If you don't, if you don't have enough open, uh, then you run out of ephemeral ports of uh, it's. Uh, the protocol is TCP, but source IP and destination uh, IP and the port on each side, that combination is your ephemeral port limit range, right? And from the load balancer to us, we hit things like WebSockets. The fact that we have all the WebSockets going through one point is impressive. Right now there's 
482,000 WebSockets open in Stack Overflow. But we run into uh, file descriptor limits on Linux because we're on one box, right? In the cloud, we would be local to you and probably on 50 load balancers, right? So you, uh, it's yes, there are pros and cons. Um, it's not strictly a win. It's just not the best fit for us. Um, usually, performance, cost, it is cheaper for us to run our own. Large databases like Stack Overflow are difficult in the cloud, right? Uh, Stack Overflow is 1.7 terabytes today. That's not huge. We are not by any means big data, but it's big enough to cause trouble. Uh, case in point, go to Azure. The maximum database you can buy is one terabyte, right? That's the biggest today, and that keeps growing. But you would have to say that there's two conversations there, right? Why don't we run on the cloud? And would we if we built from scratch, right? Moving is a tremendous cost for any company. Netflix knows this more than anybody. You have to re-engineer your whole product. So people were like, compare this to X to Y. Oh, no, you have to compare the move of X to Y. And that conversation gets so convoluted that it's, uh, it's difficult to have. A lot of people just don't understand that the cost is huge. You have to stop the world, too, to do it. Yeah, and I'm sure Netflix actually had to uh, negotiate a lot of uh, Netflix-specific features on the, the, the servers they're using on the cloud. And uh, Which leads me to another question I have for you, which is, um, so Stack Overflow is a very important site, and a rather, a rather unique site, actually. Uh, so how much of the performance... Um, tricks that you use and the expertise that you have, how much of that would uh, would actually apply to um, smaller websites, like the ones that people not working at Stack Overflow have to manage? 50-50, uh, maybe. Some of the things we do are just crazy, and some of the things are generally applicable, right? Uh, one of the things, and I try, we try and share these as much as possible. There is no monetary interest in us keeping these secrets. Uh, it helps developers save time. That's what we're all about. Save time, pain, uh, better jobs is what we're venturing into now. All of this is very important to us. Like Everyone at the core of the company believes in this stuff. So when we can open source a thing, we do it. That is the default policy is to open source. We just double check that there are no encryption keys in it. right? And if so, you need to get rebase the thing. Um, everyone loves a good force push, right? So when you're doing um, things like... Uh, what the last blog post I did on the architecture, right? It has a bunch of libraries listed at the bottom. Jill is our JSON serializer because nothing in .NET was fast enough or fewer allocations enough for us, right? Uh, Dapper is a SQL layer. It's fast. And then we do tricks in there that can be applicable to other websites too if you just know what's going on, right? It's more of if you know one layer down or half a layer down, you can get so much wins out of so many wins out of performance. Uh, Dapper, one of the things I tweeted last two weeks was uh, literal performance or literal replacements in Dapper, right? So if you have a say user type ID equal, and this query is always so in Stack Overflow's case, registered users, users who have logins. If that's if that a replacement is a string dot format today or a parameter that's always the same like a noon value today, just put it in the query. Because that one versus a parameter is hugely impactful to SQL. The query optimizer could use filtered indexes. It can make better estimates about which data is going to be filtered faster, right? If it doesn't know what that parameter is going to be next time, then it can't say this is a good way to filter the data first before using this index. So plans get way better, right? And these are very simple minor tricks we use that create a lot of uh, uh, a lot of useful things in performance and flexibility, right? Mini profiler is huge. That just lets you know what's slow. That's the first thing. People are, uh, tune things and they don't know what they're tuning. How do you know that you're making a difference? You have to measure before and after. This is so critical. When we set up Cloudflare, uh, it took us two months of setting up um, all of this infrastructure to monitor what the situation was today before we turned anything on. Um, and I can show, so like, I don't know if you can see in my room here, I've got a thing hidden behind a monitor. Let's see. So there's a dashboard over there of live metrics uh, every 15 seconds from all over our networks, right? This is just the top center data center views, right? And I can send you screenshots if you want to post them in of we have client timings from all over the world that flow into Stack Overflow. 5% of all requests to Stack Overflow tell us how long you took for DNS, page load, DOM load, and all of this stuff is in every modern major browser, right? And you can just send it back up for some percentage of requests, and we log it. Not complicated stuff, 
But unless you know what your users are experiencing, it doesn't matter, right? When you look at this data, you say Stack Overflow renders a web page in 20 milliseconds inside our data center. Load balancer sends a request, gets it back 20 milliseconds. That's awesome. The guy in Australia gets it in 500. That sucks, right? Like, unless you measure, you don't know that. And you don't really, I think a lot of developers, including me early on, you don't get an appreciation for like a, a zoomed out view of things, right? And mini profiler and all the other tools we have greatly help that, right? Mini profiler, first step, just plug it in and plug in the default view render and say, how long is this page taken? And you're like, okay, X. Okay, then drill down, scope into areas that you want to look at more, right? So a lot of those tricks, um, they work for everybody. Other ones we try and make automatic. So anything that we encounter in, like especially ASP MVC, that we find is problematic, we try and upstream into Microsoft's code base so that everyone gets an extra lease. One of the things I need to reply back to right now is the MVC team's asking about a possibility of a 524 release with a much faster uh, HTML action link engine because we can render a web page that takes hundreds of milliseconds. Well, okay, like op server takes 40 milliseconds to render a page or 160 by hitting a method that should be returning the same result every time. But due to just a, um, a pretty naive for loop in there, it's terrible. But that is a huge impact all over the application, right? We upstream things like uh, view creation dictionaries happening all over the place. Don't need to. You know, it's uh, for Stack Overflow, I think that was about, I don't know, 10 or 20 trillion allocations a day, you know, from just a couple of things that just didn't need to be initialized. They were never used because the base class, they were overridden for the base class, but the base was still creating them in a constructor somewhere. And uh, we figured this out by. I, I, every once in a while, I just go on the prod tier when I have 20 minutes, and I just dump an app pool, and then stick it in WinDBG and see what's going on. And if we can find anything in libraries that are ours, aren't ours, um, we'll upstream them if we can. Uh, there's actually a blog post I'm going to do that's specific to things we do that no one else should do. <laughs> Read uncommitted in SQL. Oh, you're going to get some hate mail on that one. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, mm. we, we don't need it. We're not a bank. What, what's the difference mm. that you saw a question as it was half a second ago or half a second forward? It, it doesn't matter. We want to get yeah, you to the question page faster, right? Yeah, that, that used to be a huge uh, discussion on, on our chat as well. And uh, yeah, it, it really depends on the application. Yes. Uh, there are applications where, yeah, it doesn't matter. And it, it's such a huge win. And uh, we're, we're lucky for that, right? And that allows us to keep SQL at around 5 to 10% CPU all the time. So when we get DDoS, it's at 90, not offline. That's, that's why we keep so much headroom, by the way. I have some questions. Sure. Um, I got some very specific ones and also some general ones, and I don't have to ask them all in a block. But one is um, you talked about using WinDBG. Do you use Perfu yep. at all? Uh, a little bit more so, more so WinDBG because a lot of other tools kind of break down with large dumps. The performance just goes off a cliff, or in the case of Visual Studio, it just runs out of memory and crashes. Uh, so that one's bad. <laughs> really hoping for Visual Studio 64 bit at some point. Uh, the uh, the Perfu, um, we, we've tried a few times. A lot of uh, a lot of what we see is when you do a dump over 12 gig or so gig or so of memory, the time to access the data I need is just so much higher that the GUI is not worth it. And I've got WinDBG scripted and everything else. Uh, the only th uh, pain on the WinDBG world is actually uh, SOS EX DLL. The binary heap dumps uh, broke in 461, and I don't really know why yet. I need to go look into that. Um, but typically we can just, you know, if you're familiar with something and you've got kind of uh, muscle memory, it's just a little easier to navigate around. I think Perfu, if you're just coming at it, is a great tool, especially if you don't have that much stuff in memory and cache like we do. Uh, for us, though, it's I think it's just a little quicker to navigate around with DBG. Got it. Uh, just one more question on that, which is yeah. um, I definitely get the the 12 gig thing that you mentioned. Uh, have you ever talked to Vance about that particular scenario, the kind of big data for Perfu? Um, no, we haven't. I, um, I wouldn't mind doing so. I think what we okay. run into typically with those, any kind of tooling like that, it's kind of like SQL, right? People get the bad idea that when you select top 100 from a query and it runs fast, that the query's fast. No, you just got 100 matches quick, right? And what we see is 
that a lot of problems inside of Stack Overflow and other apps as well, they don't do a good job of skip scanning the memory. And Perfu, I think, it has a the architecture of it, as I understand it, would actually be pretty good for this. An actual skip scan of memory is a better sampling uh, scenario than anything else, right? A lot of people just they get the front chunk of it and they, they allocate that. Well, we have these 64 gig boxes like we do, which is not crazy for a server, to be clear. These servers go up to three terabyte. These are tiny. Um, Maybe big for some people's web servers, but they're they're really like <laughs> not that populated. Uh, if you get the first chunk of memory, typically you got the startup of the app and some more. But when you're talking about large unbound chunks of memory, the allocated windows is pretty much going to allocate on the memory channel or as a chunk from beginning to end, similar to the way a program is going to read it for most of these. So when you're sampling and saying, okay, grab the first fifth, that's really not a good indicator because what really happened was. Uh, this huge allocation of tuples or something halfway in is where 60% of your memory is, right? And you just don't even see it in the sampled view, and that's usually a problem too, sampling at all, you know? Okay. Well, we'll hook you up with um, Vance after the call. Awesome. Uh, one other question, which yeah. is um, we talked a little bit about your openness around your infrastructure, yep. uh, which I imagine pretty much everyone likes. Um, there's a few other companies that do that as a as a thing. Mm -hmm. um, Backblaze is the cloud backup company that I kind of think of that's really good at yeah. that. Uh, I, I always read their posts and find them super interesting about hard drive failures. I imagine that's actually somewhat relevant for you guys too. But um, like you're obviously a, a talented guy, and if I was your boss, I'd be like, man, I want this guy doing the things that he was just talking about as opposed to writing blog posts. I'm, I'm obviously being a little bit facetious. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is the value back to Stack Overflow and being so um, you know, open about that? Those blog posts take time to write and stuff. Um, I don't know that there is. And so uh, I don't write the blog posts on company time, by the way. This is something I do at night because I strongly – so one of the things that – I didn't blog for about six months there. Uh, and a lot of people find when I issue a blog post, it's usually between you know a uh, hundred thousand and a million views on it. So I know that it gets a little bit of attention in terms of and hopefully helps some percentage of people. If it helps one percent, that's great. That's what we're about, right? Uh, I have a lot of open source projects as well that we maintain, and Mark Gravel is my partner in crime there, and he does even way more than I do, honestly. On you know uh, Dapper, Op Server, our open monitoring system. Uh, we're we're working on Boson. I don't code against that. Our our SRE team does, but we we maintain a lot of different projects here, and including .NET Core. Right, we're very active on shaping .NET Core where we can help out. Right, we can test some stuff on Stack Overflow. We can we know some weird scenarios to point out that kind of stuff. That's a a lot of time sink, and it occurred to me. A, before I wrote the last blog post, about two weeks before, I guess, that the best thing I can do is probably blog about what we do, and that's going to help per hour spent of my time than anything else for other developers, right? They can read this, and whether it's asking questions, and it helps us too. You know, being open is it's definitely a two-way street because if we post this and you say, Nick, you're an idiot. Why the hell aren't you using this? I'm like, because we didn't know about it. Thanks. Now this saved us time. This blog post took eight hours. This little thing you sent me now saved us 400 this year, right? Right, so that happens? Yeah, absolutely. Every time we, we learn something from the blog post. The, the more you share, the more you're going to learn from the community, right? And that's, uh, that's a huge win in itself for Stack Overflow. I do them at night because I think that's the best use of my time to make the world better. Um, the next blog post I'm going to put out is I'm working right now on hardware, all the hardware we run, uh, switches to network gear to everything with lots of pictures. So even if it's boring, you'll have pictures. Uh, it's more of an appendix, right? So when you're saying, what would it take to run in the cloud, or what, what does it take? Why are you at 5% CPU? Okay, of what, right? You need hardware specs to compare to. So it's more of an appendix for that, but we can make it a little fun, too. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. So one more question, and then I'll maybe open up the floor again, which is, sure. um, yeah, um, you talked about how you guys are looking at .NET Core. Um, you know, so I'm I'm one of the people on the team that talks to uh, a lot of different um, you know customers and partners uh, out in the world about why they would want to update uh, sorry adopt .NET Core, and uh, Bertrand does as well. And um, each each company has kind of a different pivot 
on why that would be interesting to them. Um, I'd love to hear why you think it would be an improvement over what you have today um, for Stack Overflow, assuming it, it is. I don't know that it would be. Would be the honest okay. answer. Yeah, uh, tell. So Stack Overflow, there's not a whole lot of wins. IIS is a very solid platform service, right? The, the wins we see are not on Stack Overflow itself, but some things behind Stack Overflow. I will op server our monitoring dashboard. This is Grafana, not op server, by the way. Um, uh, I want op server to run on every platform, right? I want you to be able to spin it up on Linux. I want you to download a Docker container, just run the thing, or just download from Git and run the thing, self-contained, right? Uh, we want that for a lot of our tooling. We have things like uh, Log Stasher, which is a uh, very simple thing that just listens to Windows event logs and shoves them into Log Stash for us, right? Because everything else that does it's kind of really big and kind of bloated by our standards. So we have a very, very simple thing to do this. If you could self-package that, where it's independent of the .NET version on the machine, the portability for tools like that, and I've got a lot of tools like this, uh, is spectacular. Not necessarily the .NET Core platform or the hosting of it or even Kestrel, but the uh, portability of it. Of course, we'll test Kestrel, right? For Stack Overflow, there are a lot of blockers to go into Core. .NET Open Auth is scary to move off of, honestly. People say, hey, this just works. It's just an open ID open OAuth endpoint. You can use any of these. That's totally not true. Uh, <laughs> there are so many quirks in the way people implement o OAuth incorrectly and OpenID Connect incorrectly <laughs> that we have encountered over the years. Because you could just search on Meta and say, my OpenID endpoint doesn't work. And you're like, OK, here's number 913 thing that we found you do slightly different, right? You didn't encode this. You don't. And all of these kind of uh, things have been built into .NET OpenAuth especially because we've contributed back to them. Right? We worked with the author who... Um, Abandon it at some point. I think last year or the year before. But uh, it's it's a little, like, big time sink. We don't blame him, but it's not going to .NET Core anytime soon. So things like that. Mini profiler. I need to port to .NET Core as soon as RC2 lands. I'll start on that venture. Uh, exceptional. Our exception longer is where we see the value right now is a lot of people find our libraries. I was talking about earlier valuable. We want to get those on core as soon as possible for everyone to else not to be blocked, right? Mm -hmm. That's, again, us trying to save developer hours. So uh, Sigil, Jill, Sigil's IL generation, uh, Jill, those are on .NET Core. Dapper's on core. StackExchange.Redis, the access, that's on core. Um, exceptional, I have a build working on core, but it needs some RC2 bits for the MVC changes, and then I'll release it on core. Um, we think there's a whole lot of value in the libraries that we maintain, and we have no problem supporting those on core, even though we're not using them that way. Uh, but those libraries, again, are used in our internal tooling. So we have a little bit of motivation. Right? And that kind of stuff we think is good. The self-contained Kestrel, uh, that's good. Stack Overflow, the behemoth website itself, I don't know. I honestly can't picture getting there for at least a year from now. Uh, we've got a big launch coming up in... Uh, uh, you know, a month or so, and then on past that. But we'll probably, um, depending on when .NET Core itself comes out of RC, uh, I'd love to have Stack Overflow just running on it <laughs> so we could give really good dog food feedback. Stack Overflow is the ultimate dog food machine. By the way, that's the other reason we do the libraries. We can run them on Stack Overflow, and we do every single time before they're pushed to NuGet. You know that thing's been well tested or at least well hammered in the hot paths before it goes up, right? And uh, if we could do some of that with .NET Core, it'd be fantastic. I don't think we're going to have a possibility to do that, though, in that time frame. So um, that's that's awesome insight. Um, you may have noticed that we've been um, doing this performance work, mm -hmm. um, uh, like tech and power benchmarks and that kind of thing. Yeah. And obviously that that's uh, early days still. Um, do you think... You know, it sounds like you have a very tuned environment. Um, do you think that those that performance work would benefit um, Stack Overflow? Uh, a little bit, especially the Kestrel stuff, right? A assuming we ran on Kestrel, but we're we're tuning some other areas that we're finding as hot paths as well, right? Uh, and, and some of that's actually translating over. And so I'm I'm very up on the performance work we're doing. Um, what well, we've configured with the benchmark repo, you can find Jill and Dapper and stuff in there. Uh, those kind of things are flowing back into .NET Core proper too, right? It's not just ASP.NET. Uh, cancellation tokens got fewer allocations. For us, allocations are definitely enemy number, I don't know, two or three or something. 
Uh, so those little things that are feeding back into .NET Core proper are going to be huge, I think, more so than the ASP.NET or um, connection-specific ones, right? Uh, there are some things like our WebSockets and stuff. We may look at merging onto Core or something in the future. I'm not really sure how that's going to go because uh, we have NetGain, which is for extremely high-performance WebSockets from Stack Overflow, and it's kind of tailored to our use cases, pushing the same message to lots and lots of people, uh, whereas the WebSockets API, which I don't think is coming out with RTM, I think it's delayed until after RTM that uh, Microsoft's working on, it's a great API, and it works very well for 99.99% of people. There are allocation and performance trade-offs for that nice API, right? Ours is a little rougher, a little more bare metal, but it's built for higher performance, more tailored to our scenario, just like any framework versus no framework, right? Um, where I think maybe there will be some contributions upstream to that, and maybe we'll, we'll be on the official one in a couple years, you know? Uh, there is certainly maintenance cost to things like that. The WebSocket protocols and things in browsers, which Cypher they're using or not, or gzipping or not, and Chrome flip-flops on this between releases, it's really annoying. Uh, those kind of things we don't want to maintain. And if we're maintaining them, that means 5,000 other people are maintaining them. And that's not good for anybody, right? So let's get it in a library. Let's do it once. Yeah, I hear an interesting kind of um, pivot with your approach is on one side, you're a super early adopter mm -hmm. of technology. But at the same time, you have a very long view on, um, you know, what's the path for Stack Overflow to be, uh, to scale, you know, one, two, and three years from now. What do those decisions look like? Uh, so I think a lot of those uh, are around kind of the hardware level up. So, for example, we're on SQL Server. How do we expand to multiple continents, right? How do we make a web page faster in Europe? This is my main thing I want to get to. And we're working out deals with uh, – I, I don't think I – I'm not sure legally how many specifics I can uh, say, but we, we've got deals with Microsoft. We've got deal, we're working on hardware stuff where how can we make this a viable thing? Because we think we can show off some hardware and some software really well to a lot of people that way more than covers your like promo calls with us to get a server in Europe, to get a server in South America or Asia. And that's something we'll be working on. And it, you know what? Maybe that involves Azure. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. We're, we're working out what the best uh, approach for that is. Let me put it this way. I can put Stack Overflow in a 2U box and serve all the read-only content I've done on continent. That's spectacular, right? That's, that's an awesome thing that we're able to do. So if we can chase that down, that's pretty good. That's like the, a big long-term plan we have. The other ones are how far is SQL going to go? How do we scale up? How do we run out of space, right? We have very, very fast storage. Well, uh, are we going to outpace the current growth rate of PCIe SSDs? Or are they going to split up the controller and screw us a little bit when we go to rate them, which happened last time? Um, <laughs> there's uh, That kind of stuff keeps us up a little bit. Um, the other bits like overall utilization and things, no, we don't even worry about because we're so low and we just we actually take time to pay down tech debt. You have to do this. People that complain that they're hitting ceilings almost never take time to actually go pay down anything or see where the slowness is, right? For anyone who's never done that, I guarantee you can shave off, in almost every case, 90% of your performance problems or CPU utilization by taking two, three weeks and just actually looking for problems, right? Um, as long as you just continually do that, or and what we do is every month or two, I'll go through and do a pass at this, and some other people help me. I'm not the only one doing this. Uh, that helps you get a much clearer vision for the long term, right? Because otherwise, you don't know what your growth patterns is or, or are, right? You don't know, is it more users? Is it more traffic? Is it all of this stuff? Again, measure. Take metrics for everything. Or is it because your code's getting worse, right? Did someone push a stupid thing that's doing a bad number random generation, right? We, we found in our code where someone was, this is from years ago. This is like eight, nine years ago. You know, we had a, a jobs tab on Stack Overflow. And this is code that hasn't seen nearly the scale of traffic that we were about to throw at it. Right? This, is, this will make a really good blog post. So we had to go through and we just tuned the crap out of everything we could to make that thing faster, get the request per second up. I think we got about 300, I'm sorry, 100 times the original request per second out of it after a two-week tuning pass. Right? Wow. Um, and then the allocations, which were unbounded, and uh, there was actually a dictionary that I kept growing, uh, were now they're just stable, under control, almost no perf impact, uh, very low memory usage. And for things like that, there would be like a sort that 
sorted all of the things randomly and took the first one? Well, no, you take a random number from zero to length and take one, right? Like, just little things like that that are so simple, but in a hot code path with, we're getting six billion hits a month. It adds up, right? Um, that's the thing. We don't necessarily plan super long term. We continually plan and just adjust a little bit. Our hardware lasts four to eight years if we would let it. We just upgrade because the driver support for the manufacturer drops out, so it's kind of a pain in the butt to keep it. Um, so again, I think we're a little odd there, maybe. Microsoft, you guys are like planning the next Azure data center with like how many billion dollars? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Bertrand and I aren't doing that. Well, eh. but you, it's interesting to see like when we're in the API reviews for .NET Core, right? How do we design this thing where it works now when .NET Core and in the contract and on desktop, which has a much different shipping pattern, right? One to two years, and people got to actually install it. Uh, versus .NET Core, we can have the library tomorrow. How can we introduce this thing? How does the type forwarding work? What interfaces can we put on now versus later? And okay, how do we do it where it actually works today? We did this with ADO.NET. And how do you do it where we can easily migrate off to a cleaner solution in the next generation, right? And uh, it's complicated. After going through that really deep with the ADO.NET guys, um, I think a lot of people on GitHub going, why don't you just do X? you got to go through that exercise beginning to end to realize what kind of position you're actually in and what the constraints are. Uh, and maybe actually advertising or blogging that specific one and seeing all of the, the you know, the walls you got to keep inside of to navigate that would be helpful. Um, because I didn't appreciate it as much as, you know, going through it. Actually talking to Emma on, in a couple hours on that. Sweet. Actually, I have a question on that, which is... Um, You've probably seen the openness of the .NET team in particular change quite a bit over the last, say, year, 18 yes. months. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a, is, is, that, is that important? Is that helping? And B, I guess in the case of API reviews in particular, which is, I think, the comment about Emo, uh, mm -hmm. is, is that important? Yeah, I think it's very important. Um, the, the community can shape something that's out because... I have a, a strong belief that when you design an API, it's crap, right? Anyone designs an API for one consumer and the use cases they're thinking of is crap. When you get your third, second, fourth consumers, you realize that it's crap and you rework it. And that's happening in public before it ever gets committed, before it ever goes to whatever. Now, Microsoft, uh, you guys don't have that problem. Like The APIs are very well thought through before they're even presented uh, in most cases, right? Sometimes we just have completely new areas and what we're picturing on or what this company and this group of people is picturing is completely different than the person designing it. And that's just, okay, we had different goals in mind when we started this. And hopefully yeah. we get somewhere. Other Our ones CD are... The API would be like that. Yeah. And some uh, we run into, we're just like, no, this won't work because of, you know, your ADO.net was like that, right? A large portion of that discussion was, okay, this looks good for SQL Server. Here's why it's bad for every other ADO.net provider, right? That was one phase of that. Um, and that's kind of cool to have in the open and just bounce back ideas. One of the things that came out of the API that just was just pushed was um, how do you get the scheme information out of a, a data set coming back, right? And DB Reader, the column that did, in, did end up getting used here was me pitching out uh, a thing in a pull request saying, here's what I think should be on it. Let's iterate. And within two hours, we had the version that looks like it is now. People just said, no, this doesn't work in SQL CE. This works for Oracle. No, these are common between everyone. And this experience from a lot of people in the field immediately chiming in. And in two to three hours, you can have a really nice, much better API that you're not going to pay for for the next how many years because it didn't have it, right? Um, so that's pretty cool, especially with type forwarding constraints and inability to add members. That happening early and now in the open is more critical than ever because of how .NET desktop works and ships, right? And I think that's one thing that Microsoft could actually push a little harder on of explaining that constraint system, especially with type forwarding. Uh, that would help the community a lot that doesn't understand why can't we do this? Well, there are reasons. They're just not well understood reasons. And I think that may um, garner a lot more goodwill too of there's a reason, guys. We're not just saying no, right? Do you, do you think, um, so that, that whole thing is, is uh, mostly a function of wanting to share code, binary libraries between .NET Core and .NET Framework and other .NET platforms. Um, do you think that's important, like that our, 
our um, strong uh, emphasis on that is well well justified or no? Um, in most cases, yeah, especially for the core libraries, it just has to be, right? Anything that's shipping on box, when, when I'm talking about the typeboarding issues, I'm specifically uh, referring to anything that ships in box on uh, desktop, right? That's where the real pain points are. We can't add this member because this member just won't be here, and it'll be a runtime blow up on core, right? So it can't be in the contract, it can't be X. The other stuff being shared, I, I don't, um, whether it's oh, good or bad, I don't see any other way. All I meant is we could have taken this opposite approach, which mm -hmm. some people have advocated, which is let's just fork .NET Core and, and .NET Desktop. They'll be extremely similar. You know, source cap compat will be possible, mm -hmm. but um, on .NET Core we'll ignore the constraints that um, .NET Desktop has and call it a day. So we thought about that early on, and honestly I couldn't, I couldn't resolve any scenario in which case my code on top of .NET could then be shared. I don't see how that would ever work or wouldn't it, be it a would, royal it pain. It wouldn't work. It yeah. wouldn't work. So I think um, it's not a matter of good or bad. I think it's the, the best choice that could have been made uh, because yeah. otherwise it's going to be endless pain for however long. You. Right? Yeah. I hope .NET... I hope the .NET desktop experience changes how the shipping is, right? So that changes to a generation don't take two years. Uh, and I think with uh, Windows 10 and some of that being pushed, maybe that's possible coming up, right? If you don't have the latest version, you can go get it and install it. That not being shipped through or exclusively through Windows Update, which is how the vast majority of them are applied, uh, maybe that just gets better. And it seems to be headed that direction. I, I don't run Windows 10, so don't ask me. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any other choice. I think it had to be this. Makes sense. That I also agree. Yeah. Uh, do you have questions, Bertrand? Otherwise, I'll just keep on going through my list. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I, I was going to uh, maybe go over some of the points uh, that Nick is making in, in his latest um, Stack Overflow architecture blog post. Feel free. Um, sure. Yes, yeah, so there is a lot in there. Um, I really recommend people uh, read that blog post. We'll, we'll uh, link to it, obviously, in the description. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, can you talk about uh, caching with, with Redis, uh, sure. which is a, a section of, of the blog post? Uh, okay, so the way, and, and by the way, all of these topics will be deep. That's not. That's the first blog post. If you click mm. up top, there's a whole Trello board. Please vote on what you want to hear. This has no value other than it gets posted quicker. Uh, so if you want that, go click it. Um, there's some fun stuff in there, like how John Skeet breaks everything. It, and he does, literally. An outlier jerk. So uh, with Redis, what we do is we cache, typically in L1, L2. This is something we'd love to move into the Stack Exchange Redis library. It's an API, and we need to design and think over and put in. And me and Mark want, like, two solid months to get all this stuff done. Uh, reality is we have production to worry about. So what we do is we typically cache an HTTP cache or system net cache or whatever we have these days, and we uh, do an L1 there. And if it's not there, you go to Redis, and that's L2 for most things, right? So inside of our code base, like I said, it's a multi-tenant application. That's why we need to design this API that's not strictly for us for a multitude of reasons. The main one is we run multiple copies of the same thing, right? Stack Overflow is exactly like server fault, exactly like super user, it's exactly like bicycle st stack exchange that gets like three questions a week, right? All of the same code base, same exact code running, and we have different Redis caches. Currently, we use the database ID in Redis to be the differentiator. The site ID in the sites table, because we're not very creative at naming, that gets used for a lot of things. The database in Redis, the Elasticsearch index name, that integer ID is used for a lot of stuff. So in Redis, we'll look up in L1, uh, and the L1's with a prefix of the DBID, all underneath. You don't have to use this every time. It's just when we, you do current.site cache is what we call, and you do a .get or a .set or a .get set. And uh, when you look through there, we're just doing L1 hit. If it's not there, L2. If it's not in Redis, then we go to whatever the source is, right? That could be uh, SQL. It could be an API. It could be we generate the thing. It could be a really expensive view. It could be whatever, right? Uh, and then other things go straight to Redis. It could be uh, a sorted list in Redis that we want to take chunks out of, right? One of the big optimizations on the table right now for Mark Gravel and I to work on is when you go to users on Stack Overflow, click the Users tab, 
uh, there's a list of users that are top rep this week, this month, this year, right? And every time we save a user, uh, we cache that, I think, for two minutes right now. So that list up there, uh, we get the list of users, the first 36, but we to make the paging work, we have to keep the whole list in memory, right? That's 4 million tuples. If you go to the all list, it's 8 million tuples. It's kind of a pain in the butt. And then you take those uh, 36 users on the page, and you go get their top tags and things, and you come back, and you just play them, like their avatar or some of that stuff. Uh, what we'd want to do is move that to Redis as a sorted list. Then when you save someone's rep, you just send a message to Redis to update those four or five tables, right? The delta on their rep for month, week, year, quarter, and total. And then Redis is just sorting the list. And we pull it from Redis. You can have nearly real time. We can eliminate all the allocations on the web tier. We only get the 36 we need, and paging works, right? You can get all of these kind of wins, and that's where Redis really works for us, is it's super fast. We can run a quarter million ops per second, no problem. We do this regularly with mobile. Um, and we use it for other things besides just caching. The Provident service, uh, Kevin Montrose has a blog post about that. I think I linked to it from that one. Uh, that uses hundreds of gigs of memory to cache you know, where developers are in the world, what tags you like so we can suggest things to you better. Um, and we also use it for... Uh, uh, other types of sorted set calculations, like your mobile feed, right? We continually churn things in and out of the mobile app for Stack Exchange. What's interesting, what we think is going to be interesting to you. Again, that uses Providence data. Uh, we're using Redis to control those lists and things. We use it as a locking mechanism, like a, as a mutex point, right? Set a key. Uh, try to set a key. If it's already there, you get a false back. Then you didn't get the lock. So we use that for um, things like queues. When things happen, and we need to aggregate into our central, again, sites database. Terrible name, but we're stuck with it. Uh, unless we take some outage time. Uh, then we took, um, we put all of this in network tables, network posts, network users. These, When you look at your top bar on Stack Overflow, right, and you see your reputation in the drop-down there, what happens is we save your user, and we, sh we shove an event into this Redis queue. And this other, um, this other app pull over here is, and there's nine of them on the servers. They use a lock, a Redis lock can be, and they're just turning away trying to empty this queue. And when they take an item and get it out for rep, they update your global network table, stick your rep items in there, and then when that's done and returns, we send a WebSocket request to you saying you've got something. Because when you load it then, it will actually be there because that pulls from the network table, not the per site table, right? Because we can't be querying 400 sites to get your collective rep. That'd be insane. Um, so we use Redis for uh, all of that stuff. And like I said, WebSockets, we do PubSub through Redis. It's got a PubSub mechanism. And the WebSocket servers, very minimal. Again, net gain, open source. We listen to it, and you send a message to Redis. Anyone listening to that machine or anything downstream gets that message, and they relay it over WebSockets to the users. So it's actually got a multitude of uses for us, and it is rock solid. Redis has been running for... Uh, we, we patch it. That's the only reason it goes down. <laughs> like, we patch Linux underneath it. Redis has been uh, very, very stable. And the author is awesome. We've had an issue trying to find out why something was happening. And it was due to our code, by the way. Uh, he sent us a patch literally in five minutes. I was kind of blown away. That's open source paradise right there, right? Absolutely. Wow. Very impressive. And Salvatore's awesome. Uh, um, so I, oh, go ahead. Uh, I have a question that's mm -hmm. uh, it's a good segue to a question I had, which is, you said that um, you know you worked with this this uh, this guy, uh, and he was incredibly um, uh, good for you. Uh, so you had another engagement um, last year uh, with the .NET team uh, about about Reujet. Uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about that engagement um, and how that all went? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I thought it, we thought it was Ryujit. Is it Ryujit? We've uh, been pronouncing it for years. Okay. Uh, uh, you can pronounce it however way you want. I call it Ryujit, but feel free to call it the other name. Okay. Well, I don't know. Now they've got a Star Wars character and stuff. All right. So, um, yeah, what we found was uh, there was a guy on our team who reported this. It actually turns out two months earlier, or like two weeks earlier, some, some time period earlier, uh, Mike Granahan, I think I pronounced your last name right. He was uh, saying, this doesn't work. This, I'm seeing this, and it doesn't do this. And we're like, you're nuts. There's no way that's happening. I looked at the code. You're insane. And uh, we ignored it. We're like, well, it's a one-off. There's something just he's doing wrong. And uh, we told him that, and we're like, yeah, you're crazy. So then uh, one day we're doing something totally unrelated, and I'm trying to see how fast it is, and many profilers not showing on my screen. 
Uh, when you go to Stack Overflow, Mini Profiler runs for every request, for every user. It's very low overhead. So we run it locally, of course, for everything, right? And typically, you see a little timer on your screen, and you, you get to debug, and you're like, what's slow about this new thing? And you go, and it wouldn't show. And uh, what normally happens is we cache it in L1 memory on a local machine, the, the L1 cache, for, uh, I don't know, an hour or something. And uh, once we dug down into it, and Mark starts adding debug statements like crazy, going, you know, and more and more hair coming out, uh, there, um, what methods... We're like, okay, this is obviously just crazy, so we'll just log inside of every method what's getting passed. And then it turns out that even by doing that, you actually cause the problem to go away due to it being a tell call recursion issue. Um, <laughs> so even more fun, right? Like you're debugging it, and it goes, ah! Um, when we got down to it, we, figured, we finally found that the last method was not getting the parameter we passed in. Right, it would turn out as zero or 500 or three, and it was a, you know, it's a ultimately ended up being a memory offset of a byte, I think, was wrong, so or eight bytes. Um, we, uh, it's it's neat because we have the guys capable of digging in and debugging something like this, whereas everyone else, you're just like, I swear it's the compiler, right? And it's actually the compiler. That's the most frustrating experience in the world when it's actually the compiler, right? 99.99% of the time, you're full of crap. The compiler's right, you're wrong. And then every once in a while, no, it's another thing, right? And we actually found a few more RyoJIT bugs with regex compilation. Um, but uh, it's, it's kind of neat because the company allows us the time, and it's, it's worth our time, it's worth everyone's time, for us to just take a couple hours and dig into this, right, and see what the issue is. So, uh, and the, the .NET team's response, and you guys got back to us like that day, right, which is pretty cool. And we worked through it behind the scenes before anyone knew because we didn't know if it's a security issue, right? And under crazy scenarios, it could have been, right? If someone passed is admin true or false to a tell call or something. Um, but that was, uh, that was a neat experience, I think, because it was fixed, and the, the regex ones and the other ones were fixed in the open. Um, I don't know. It was fun. I, I, I imagine you guys hated us for a couple weeks there, though. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, um, we had official... Company provided pictures of you guys in the hallway, and company provided darts, and we had time allocated for us to throw the darts at them. Uh, Not at all. Not at all. Uh, but no. actually, mandatory. You you would get punished. Yeah, if you mandatory. Did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and then you would get a, Yeah, then you would get an ice cream cone mm. after you threw the darts. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, no. People make a big deal out of that. I don't. Um, I don't honestly see. Like, that's a really, really subtle bug, right? Um, I mean, obviously, you guys changed some Q&A procedures after that. We added more tests and everything. and uh, it, it, But I don't. that wasn't a huge deal to us, right? That's just like, okay, we found bug number 900-something of things in the world this week. Uh, that, that wasn't a big thing around here. That's just kind of Tuesday, you know? But uh, I, the fact that the other people found it interesting and we can detail how you debug it. I actually have a blog post sitting here that I haven't ever finished called Why You Should Take the Time to Debug, right? You're finding this. If you have the skill to debug something, you kind of, in my view, owe it to the world to dig in and debug it. If you know how to solve this in an hour and you've got a trail on it, or 10 hours, doesn't matter, uh, and you are allowed by your company to do it in your spare time, you actually like doing it anyway, then go do it. You're going to save thousands of developers from tearing their hair out. Right or wasting time figuring out what this thing is later. It'll yeah. All you're gonna get is a line and a bug report later. But don't you feel good from saving thousands of other people their time and their lives? And now this guy gets to spend five more hours with his kid this weekend because he didn't figure this crap out. Right? That's awesome. If you can do that, spend your time doing that. And we have some guys who are really awesome at debugging. So that's where we want to put their time. You know? I think that's kind of cool that we can. Oh, awesome. uh, that makes sense. Uh, actually, we're just uh, just we're obviously joking about the darts. We were actually super thankful for um, uh, what you guys did working with us, collaborating, uh, and the, the the tone about Stack Overflow was very positive during that whole thing and after. Oh, that was way better than tone about Microsoft right here. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> no, nah, it's it's great because the, especially with the open source stuff now, right? Anything that we can work with and upstream and improve both ways, then hey, great. Our stuff's only as fast as your stuff, right? It's built on .NET, so uh, if we can improve both, then hell yeah. Okay, we just got a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, uh, th there is actually a, a small, smaller or medium-sized announcement that we'd like to make before we uh, we close the show today. Uh, so there is a blog post that we're also going to link to. Um, we are releasing today an experimental version of uh, .NET Core debugging working in VS Code, which is it, it's a big deal for us, I guess. Oh yeah, I've, I've got it. Uh, I've got the blog post up here, and then I lost it in a reboot. I'm gonna. I saw uh, Hunter tweet a while ago. I grab that. That looks. Uh, that looks pretty cool because I need to test it on. Um, uh, it's one wanted the instructions for how to build VS Code on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and I didn't have a TV last night, but I'm going to run through that after this. No, Mark's actually done it. Uh, the only thing Mark didn't know at the time, unfortunately, is there is a build for Node on uh, ARM 6 and 7 available. Uh, he just couldn't find it that day. And he spent, uh, I think, possibly hours <laughs> waiting for Node to build on a Pi, which, by the way, takes forever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, I'm going to fire it back up here, and with the actual install, we should be able to just publish a bog post list of commands to run it. And I think there were, back when he tried it a uh, month or two ago, there were zero code changes needed. So that's pretty cool if we can fire it up again. I run it locally because I um, didn't like how the preview thing worked. I have a fork of VS Code for my blog posts. Cool. Makes sense. Um, uh. Anything else you guys are curious about? The, why, I don't know if you have any questions. I, I'm sure we could go on for hours. Uh, unfortunately, we only have that hour. So, uh, this has been awesome. Uh, it, it's been really, really interesting. I'm, I'm sure uh, everybody watching uh, will agree with that. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Sure. Um, next week, uh, I won't be hosting the show. Uh, we are going to have uh, Casey Ullenhut, uh, Beth Massey, and Maria Nagaga um, presenting the show. Uh, so that, that's going to be something uh, different and uh, super interesting. So tune in next week for that, uh, that show. And uh, I want to thank you again, Nick and uh, Rich. And uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye, everyone. See Thank ya. you. It was awesome.